do. And together I want to uh, just uh, stand for the reading of God's word that we would together would allow it to become in our life. Let me read this out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one of us may receive what is due f- us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who, knew, who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Uh, this is the word of the Lord. Go ahead, be seated. If I haven't had the chance to meet you, uh, my name is Phil, and I have the privilege of being uh, the lead pastor here at the square. And today, for the next half an hour, I want to just simply take time and invite you into a morning where I believe it matters that together we look at the heart and the vision and the identity of who we are as a church family and the season that is in front of us. And this passage out of 2 Corinthians 5 has become an anchor of identity for our community. I believe that here more than any other passage in the New Testament, Paul displays his vision for what he believes the church is and what he believes the purpose of his life is. And as he speaks to the deep aches of his heart, he puts on display an identity, an identity that I believe you and I are being called to find ourselves in and being called to follow. And this is an identity that is built around these two pictures that are of such significance. First, a picture of exile, and second, a picture of being an ambassador that there is something about the way Paul sees life and what he sees out of the church and what he sees as the hope of God that are connected to these pictures. And he is writing to this Corinthian church, inviting them to see what he sees and to be the church that God is making. And I believe it's in this picture that God is inviting us to understand the church that he is making us into. And I wanna begin today by quoting a a profound theologian you might have heard of, his name is uh, Mike Tyson. (laughs) Uh, And uh, I love this quote, reminded of it uh, actually several times this week in conversations. Everyone has a plan uh, until they get punched in the mouth. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And I love this because I think, whether you've actually ever been punched in the mouth or not, um, I think we have a deep understanding of how, how much this holds true. That, that you and I, as we step into seasons, as we make plans and course direction and, and, and become people who move towards what we believe our lives are about, we find that we can have the best intentions, we can long for the greatest things, But the ultimately moments come like a punch in the mouth and how easy it is to allow that to sway us to the left or the right. And one of the things that I believe that is important for us in this moment as a church 
is to come back to these places of asking some of the most common questions. Questions we've asked before, questions we've answered before, questions we've asked together and answered together, yet somehow they need to be re-answered in our lives over and over again. And I believe one of the significant reasons is because in many ways, the season that we have walked through is a season that punched us right in the mouth. I'm not here to speak back to 2020. I'm pretty ready to never talk about 2020 again for the rest of my life. <laughs> but I, I, I say it in this way, that what happened in the last several years was that it required the church, even appropriately so, to move from ordinary to reaction, to move from what was intention before crisis, division, pain, upheaval, towards responding to circumstances that were unique and challenging. And often it is in circumstances like that where you and I adapt and react because we must and it's healthy and it's what leaders and communities do. There is a subtle point of pain that if we're not careful is that where we react stops being our reaction and becomes our normal. The ability to go from reaction back to intention becomes far harder than we ever dreamed or imagined. And I want to tell you that I believe that this is a season where you and I have to walk into the future, no longer responding or reacting to what was either as a community, as a people, or in our personal lives, but there is a moment where we need to step into what God has planned for us. The, the picture in my mind, and I'm gonna use multiple analogies this morning, and I know that's bad public speaking, so I'm just acknowledging it, and then I'm gonna do it anyways is that you know, anyone who's played sports or follows sports, and the vast majority of us understand this, that, that when you are in a position where you need to move, where you need to respond, the worst posture you can be in is being on your heels. Because your ability to lead, your ability to respond, your ability to go where you've been called to go actually becomes deeply minimized. And in so many ways, this is the picture of what I have seen happen in the church, happen in our church, happen in our lives, happen in people's lives, is that the consequences of challenge over the last several years have moved people onto their heels. And I'm just here to tell you that your future can't be found there. And our future can't be found there. And while it is a simple change to move from pressure on your heels to pressure on your toes, I actually believe that beginning the actions of intentionality matter in the season more than I know how to put language around. Because I believe it is that very thing that is going to lead us into the future that God has called us to have. These questions that come back around again and again, questions of who are we? Questions of why does it matter? Questions of where are we going? The reason these questions come back and need to be redefined and re-looked at and re-secured over and over again is because they are the questions of the deepest aches of our heart. They are questions of identity, of purpose, and of direction. You were never meant to live void of these things. And the power and the significance of them is that they all speak to each other. If you do not know who you are, you will not know why you're alive. And if you do not know why you're alive, you will not know what to give your life to and where to do it. Identity was the only thing that can clarify purpose and purpose is the only thing that can clarify direction. And it is a season where what God wants to do is to reclaim a place in us personally and communally of restoring the very identity, purpose, and direction that we carry. And this is why we as a people must constantly keep identity at the very center of our focus. I love this quote by Tim Keller, a profound pastor theologian out of New York who's influenced so many. He says this, that the Bible says that our real problem is that every one of us is building our identity on something besides Jesus. I wonder in this last season, where you're on your heels and where identity is drifted. I wonder for us where we have become on our heels, where our identity has drifted because my friends, the minute identity drifts, so does purpose and so does direction. And I believe this is a moment where God wants to restore 
who we are and who we've been called to be. And the picture that Paul puts in front of us in 2 Corinthians 5, this picture of exile ambassador, this unique mixture of two worlds we wouldn't expect to go together is actually a picture of the future of the heart of our church and the core identity that we carry. But it's not a picture that Paul creates. It's a picture that Paul understands because it's the story that God has been writing since the beginning. God has created his people, though exiles, to be ambassadors. He has called us, though we live in one place, we belong to another. But where we live, we actually have a purpose, the purpose of expanding the beauty and the nature of the kingdom of God. And there is a person in the Old Testament who puts this on display in a unique way. And that's Daniel, a prophet and an incredible person who is held in the stories of the Old Testament. There maybe is no one outside of the person of Jesus in the scriptures that is as pure hearted as the person of Daniel. Daniel is a shorter book. We don't have all of the details of his life, but everything we see of him, he is a man who lived in this way of a compelling nature. In many ways, you look to him and you see a heart of purity. You see a heart of honor. You see a heart of faithfulness. You see a heart that is held with radical trust in Jesus, yet in radical love for those he lives around. Daniel lives at an important moment in the story of Israel. When Babylon comes and destroys Jerusalem and the people of Judah are sent into exile. At 18 years old, Daniel is taken from Jerusalem and into captivity and he lives the rest of his life in Babylon. That this story of Daniel's life is actually an invitation to the story of the lives that you and I have been called to live. There's a lot of incredible moments. If you've ever read the book of Daniel or you know, if you grew up in church, I guarantee that you, you heard some of the stories of the book of Daniel. Daniel, who's taken into the king's court, has all of these things change about his nature, right? He's renamed, he lives among a different people, he dresses different, his job's different, his location is different. But yet at the same time, there's such an established identity in him that he knows the places that will not change, that he refuses to change. Or he keeps faithful to the law and the dietary restrictions and yet God blesses him in the midst of it. It's also the stories of Daniel's three friends who refused to bow to King Nebuchadnezzar and refused to worship anyone but God alone, thrown into the fire, but in the fire is a fourth man who rescues and redeems. And it's here that there is a radical movement within Babylon itself of recognizing the power and the significance of Yahweh. And in Daniel's life, he is a prophet who grows in faith and leadership. The kings that he's around, he serves six different kings in his life, begin to learn to trust Daniel with great conviction Daniel is faithful, Daniel is honest, Daniel is blessed, Daniel stewards what's been put in front of him. And of course, there's a moment though where great jealousy occurs within the other leaders and ambassadors around Daniel. His favor has grown so much, it says that the king wants to actually place the entire kingdom in his charge. But because there's jealousy, a plan is devised to bring Daniel down. They come to the king and in this moment, they say to the king that you're great. How, how many times do the traps in our lives begin with the flattering of your ego? We should always just be aware of that. And as they're proclaiming his greatness, they come up with an idea that the people would know his greatness, that for 30 days, nobody would be allowed to worship anybody but this king. And the king thinks to himself, that sounds like a great idea. That's, that's, don't ever think that, that's not a great idea. But to him, it was a great idea. The problem was that he loved Daniel and he knew Daniel worshiped Yahweh. He just was too arrogant and powerful to see the circumstances of what his own decisions would mean. In his culture, once a king made a decree, it could not be undone. So under this plan, he declares this truth. No one is allowed to worship anyone but the king for the next 31 days, and anyone who does so will be put to death. And it's here we find ourselves in a moment in Daniel chapter six that I actually think speaks to something so significant about who we are. Daniel chapter six picks up the story and this is what it says. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room 
where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. Just a little bit of context, Daniel chapter six. Uh, Daniel's 85 years old at this point. 18 years old when he's taken captive into Babylon, faithfully served 67 years. And we see a moment where to put it extremely lightly, Daniel's plan takes a punch in the face. What was happening suddenly has radical interruption. A decree restricting the very thing Daniel has done three times a day for 67 years will now cost him his life. But you can't miss the beauty of it. Without hesitation, Daniel's first response is to go to his upper room where the windows open towards Jerusalem and to pray. To pray. And it seems so small. Yet I'm telling you what seems so small speaks of the greatest things. Because in this moment, what is actually being put on display is a man who has come to terms with his identity. He has come to terms with his purpose and he has come to terms with his direction. And no matter what comes in front of him, he will not allow those things to sway who he truly is. It's a picture of somebody who knows what it means to be an exile, yet an ambassador. And that's going to allow circumstances that we may not want and may not always choose to come towards us, but no longer stop us or refrain us from being who God has called us to be. And there's this simple line in this story that captivates me. That Daniel went to his room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. It's here that every day for 67 years, Daniel in exile would open his doors, unable to see Jerusalem, just staring in the direction of where he belonged. And he would center his identity on Christ, on, on God. He would center his identity on who he knew he was. He would center his idea on the faithfulness of Yahweh. He knew that even though the presence of God we used to exist over there in the nature of the temple before it was destroyed by the very people he now belonged to. That that direction that was being pointed was a statement of what was true in the world and what was true about him. And for 67 years, he opened his windows towards not simply a location, but he opened his windows to the promises of God that moved in his life, no matter whether he was home or in Babylon, no matter whether he was in victory or in exile, because opening his windows to Jerusalem was a statement of an identity that nothing could shake. And see what happens when you and I get into difficult situations, we do not do what Daniel does. We look for ways out. But let me just tell you, this is the beauty. Daniel did not open his windows, longing for an escape route from Babylon. Daniel opened his windows to get understanding about his purpose of being in Babylon. And when you have your heart set and your window open towards the true reality of the world and the true king of the world and the true hope of the world, what it becomes is not the plan of how you escape your circumstances, but the anchor of hope of who you've been called to be in the midst of them. It's a picture of identity and purpose, and direction. The men find Daniel. He's taken to the king. The king is grieved. He loves Daniel. This is not what he wanted. And of course, Daniel famously is thrown into a den of lions. The night comes and goes. The king, so afraid, comes in the morning, but Daniel's unharmed. And this miraculous moment actually leads to the very situations 
We're now under the next king who comes, King Cyrus. The people of Israel begin to be sent back home and allowed to restore Jerusalem, its walls, and its temple. Think about the power of one man who opened his windows towards Jerusalem and how he partnered with the dreams of God for the plans and the purposes of his people. I wonder, is our window open to Jerusalem? Is the reality of who God is and who he has called us to be become an anchor in our life that no matter where we are, we yield back to our true king and our true kingdom, not to escape our life, but to understand our life, not to escape our Babylon, but to know our purpose in the midst of it. Because I'm telling you, friends, that until we actually establish, like Dando, Daniel, a window that we don't open temporarily, but a window that stays open for the next 67 years, we will not be able to walk into the promises that God has for us. See, the power is that Daniel, Daniel is opening his window in a direction for a reason because Daniel opens his window because he's standing in the promises of God through the power of the word of God. Daniel chapter three actually talks about this, that Daniel, the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, who was made ruler of our Babylonian kingdom, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned towards the Lord God and pleaded him with prayer and petition in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. That Daniel, as he positioned his heart towards the truth and he actually yielded to the authority of scriptures, he believed Jeremiah more than he believed Babylon. He believed Jeremiah more than he believed his circumstances. And he believed Jeremiah that, that what that meant, that the situation he was in, though he would not choose it, was actually a situation of purpose and direction. But Daniel anchored himself in the word of God to realize that while he was in exile, his exile had purpose. That God had not made mistakes. He had actually placed him where he had placed him for profound purposes and direction. And what Daniel is speaking to is this moment in Jeremiah 29, where Jeremiah gives language, not only to this very specific season that Daniel was walking through, but the heart and the dream of God for his people. In Jeremiah 29, one of the most famous lines that people know from the scriptures about a God who has a plan, not for harm, but for good. But this picture is a picture of an identity, exiles and ambassadors. Let me read Jeremiah's words to you that Daniel anchored his life in. This is what Jeremiah 29 says, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all that I have carried into exile from Jerusalem into Babylon, build houses and settle down plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives and your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there and do not decrease. Also seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and I will fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me that I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all of your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. For 67 years, Daniel anchored his identity in the promises of God and the purposes of who he truly was and why he was truly alive which meant the minute 
A death sentence was placed on prayer. The only move Daniel had was prayer. Because he understood who he really was. And he understood why it mattered. And he understood the direction of his life. And it was a direction for the good of Babylon. Because this is the power of what we often miss. The people of God in Jeremiah 29, the devastation of Jerusalem, we have no ability to truly understand the grievous nature of it. The temple destroyed, the presence of God leaves. God's people, his covenant people, destroyed and flung across the nations. The grief and the pain, the whole, Jeremiah writes lamentations because of the distress and the pain of the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem. And now those who have been enslaved live by the very ones who did this. And there are prophets all around speaking that this is not God's plan, that Babylon will be punished, that we're getting out now. And Jeremiah writes to the exiles and he says, no. Do not let your hearts be deceived by these lies under the name of prophets. Do you want to understand why I have carried you into exile? My friends, I can tell you right now, you can find as many prophets you want that want to convince you of why you should hate, why you should divide, why you should retreat, why you should look at the situations of our country and our city. You can find prophets all day long to tell you that God's plan is to move you right now into making you rich and that God's moving you right now to hate your enemies. I'm telling you they're lying to you because the heart of God has always been found in the heart of exiled ambassadors. That God places the people he loves among their very enemies because the secret is that his enemies are also his beloved. And this is what Daniel sees that everyone else refuses to. The Babylon is a place that God wants to restore and redeem. It's not just simply a place to escape from. I wonder if we see what God sees. But I'm telling you, Daniel could see it because three times a day he opened his window to Jerusalem and he anchored himself in the plans and the promises of Yahweh that for all Babylon had done, God had a plan, a God of futures and of hopes, a God of restoration and of peace, a God who would invite Daniel, a slave, to seek the prosperity of the city that enslaved him because it captures somehow that does not make sense in our humanity, the foolishness of the love of God. That we have been placed and our own Babylon, just as intentionally and just as on purpose. And this is the heart of what Paul's saying in 2 Corinthians 5. It's this very identity that Paul is speaking to. This is when he says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view that we once regarded Christ in this way. He's saying there is a different way to see being alive once you've come into Christ. My question is, do you see you the way God sees you? And do you see Atlanta the way God sees Atlanta? Because until we get in God's viewpoint of the situations around us, we are constantly going to be listening to the very whispers of our heart that will deceive us and not the invitations of the radical way of Jesus for the transformation of a city in the midst of all that's happening around us. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. See, it's right here in this picture 
that we see the invitation of identity, of purpose, and direction. Because until you set your eyes, until you open your window on your true home, you will default one of two places. You will either become like Babylon or you will despise Babylon. And I'm here to tell you, do not do either. The church of Jesus has allowed one of those two options to become their way forward. The church of Jesus abandoning the truths of God and the truths of the scripture because we are bowing to the Babylon around us to be liked and loved by them. But then the same breath, how many around us want to just make their enemies pay in the name of Jesus. See, it is why we have to understand this picture to know who we are, because it is only exiles who are ambassadors that understand why you have been placed in a Babylon, not to become like it, but to lay down your life for it. And it speaks to the reason the church even exists. And again, I just remind you, if you don't know who you are, you won't know why you're alive. And if you don't know why you're alive, you won't know what to give your life for and where you have been called to give it. So if we let these pictures speak to us, what do they say? Paul would say we are sons and daughters reconciled through Christ back to the Father who now carry the substance of new creation. You have an identity, an identity that actually anchors who you are, a window that you need to open permanently in your life and come back to again and again and again and again. The posture of where your hope comes from. Why does it matter? Because those who have been reconciled have now been given the ministry of reconciliation in partnership with the Son. My friends, we are not living in a life where God is sovereignly doing all that he wants to do, just playing games with our lives. I believe in a sovereign God, make no question about it, but God in his sovereignty has invited his people to participate in the movement of his kingdom and our lives actually have eternal consequences. So you were not saved simply to be reconciled. You were saved to be invited into the ministry of reconciliation to the entire world. We have been saved to an assignment. That's why it matters. Because God has given the church, whether wise or foolish, the responsibility of partnering with God for the continuation of the ministry of Jesus. We are not here simply for ourselves. In fact, we are here not primarily for ourselves. We are here to be reconciled on behalf of God to a world. Where are we going? We are going where ambassadors go, into foreign kingdoms, taking the kingdom that they belong to and expanding the rule and reign of Jesus to the very place we live and the people we live among. If you let Paul and Daniel begin to speak together, who are we? A community of the reconciled, a people of the new Jerusalem, John sees the new Jerusalem, the people of God coming down, dwelling in our southern Babylon with our windows open to our true home. Why does this matter? The king of Jerusalem is in love with those who dwell in Babylon. He died so they wouldn't have to. Babylon will face what it has sowed. But Jesus died so that anyone Anyone who would come to repentance would find life. He's placed us here on purpose so that what we see out our windows would manifest on the streets we live on. Where are we going? The destiny our king has promised us and the assignment he has given us as an ambassador. A church that contends for the awakening of Atlanta. We are going to People unreconciled, families divided, marriages broken, neighborhoods abandoned, places religion has left and culture has lied to. We are going to Jerusalem and we are going to take as much of Babylon with us as we can. The church God is making is a church with windows open. The church that God is making sees what many have refused, that his enemies are his beloved and that he has placed us in Babylon, not to become like it, but through the power of Jesus to transform it and to see a city rescued and the people saved. Matt, you can come on up. 
the church God is making knows who it is, knows why it matters, and knows who it's been called to be. As I close out, I, I, I want to share, I often, when I look back at our church, I see these really important seasons that we've walked through. This is a, a way too oversimplistic uh, review of the life of our church, too narrow, but in many ways there's truth to the higher levels of this. Emily and I moved here in December of 2012 and began the process of planting the church in 2013. And really, those first three years, 2013 through 2015, were the years of, where God was just giving birth to a community. Some of you were here then, many of you were not. But we were being born as a church. The next season, 2016 through 2019, was a season where God was giving identity to who we were. He was marking us with specific purposes and plans and assignments, things he's called us to carry. 2020 and 2021 for everybody, for every church. While there were many things that happened in the midst of it, probably what stood at the surface was challenge. It was a year of great challenge that required reaction and response, pain and transformation. And 2022 was a season where what I knew is that God began to restore things that had been broken or missing. Things that needed to come back began to come back. Things that never were meant to come back did not. Things that needed to be added did. There was this internal work of restoration that God began to do. And for those that were here over this last year, when Emily and I, in this, over the summer of 2022, we went on a sabbatical. We, we had this deep sense that there was an initial season of the square that was coming to a close. And there was a second season that was coming upon us. And I'm realizing that that season is here. That season is now. And it's a season of mission. And, you know, anybody who grew up mowing the, their own lawn with a gas mower, you know, whether it's the first time of the year or it's been a little while, and especially if you have an old one, and you yank that cord, right? And nothing. And so you do it four or five times and then you check the gas and you check the oil and you pump that button too many times and then it floods it and you know all those things that happen. And about 10 minutes later, the lawnmower hasn't started, right? But there's that point where you realize you're, you're beginning to move the engine. You're beginning to get power. And there's that final point where you crank something and it begins to move and it begins to go into motion. I believe that is a picture of the season that we are in. We are not going to move from one season to the next simply by chance or by simply the fact that it is what it is. I believe we are going to move into the next season because we grab down and take hold of the promises of God and the truth of what he has called us to do. And we begin to pull and to pull and to pull until something steps in and something wakes up and something comes alive that we then walk into the plans and the promises of God for us. It's a season of ownership for the mission that God has called us to have. And let me just remind you, whether it's been a while or maybe it's the first time that you've heard why we're alive. Friends, seasons where you get punched in the mouth will make you forget why you're alive. You have distinct purposes in your life. We together as a community have distinct purposes and we are never meant to live alone. Our purposes were always meant to blend together. Let me just remind you, about why God decided in 2013 to start a church. Square is called to be a house of prodigals where those who are confused or uncertain can find hope and healing. The square is called to be a people of grace who love like Jesus and become on mission together in the midst of a broken and hurting world. The square is called to embody an example, faithful allegiance to Jesus in a secular age. The square is called to put courage in the heart of the church and to be witnesses of Jesus and his gospel. The square is called to restore biblical literacy and spiritual formation in the life of believers. The square is called to live lives of first love for Jesus, 
marked by sincerity and grace. The square is called to encounter the presence of God and to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and to see his gifts and his authority and his healing come in our city. The score is called to love the suffering and to bring acts of justice and compassion for the marginalized. The score is called to create a church for our children who will be empowered to walk into a new world as beloved sons and daughters who know who they are in Christ. The square is called to resource the entire body of Christ by going first into the pain and the tension of our day and creating pathways of transformation for all who need help. The square is called to raise up missionaries and church planners who will take the gospel to our city, to our nation, and to our world. The square is called to contend for a spiritual awakening in our day. And I think it, where believed begs the question, how could we possibly see all this? And I'm just reminded about the power of one man who opened his window to Jerusalem. I wonder what an entire community could do. I actually think if our entire church, how many ever that is, all opened our windows to the true king and the true kingdom. and begin to take steps towards taking ownership of the mission he's called us to have. I think this is too little, not too much. And just in this, let me tell you some direct next steps of what I believe this means for us. The first, which is kind of a big announcement, though first service didn't treat it like that. Probably it would just set too serious of a tone is that we just know it's time for us to secure our home. And in this season, I want you to know that we believe that isn't actually going to be found in a moving away, but in actually pursuing a major rebuild and remodel of our own property, which is significant. And I'm not hearing this morning, here this morning to, to talk about that in great detail. I just want you to know that is we have to make room for what God wants to do. And I have a little picture here. You have that up, Skylar, I think maybe, of just understanding kind of what we're looking to do. The back part is that parking lot. I, again, I just want you to know we have things in motion that we are going to take time and talk through as a church family about that. You can go back to that other slide. I, but it's not just that we need to secure our home. Uh, there's some things that have real importance of this season. We are in this moment where we are relaunching our house churches, what we once called missional communities, because we know actually at the core of our identity of who we are as a church was something about learning how to gather together and find family who lives on mission. And it's time to put a re-emphasis back on that part of who we are, to reclaim that central sense of identity, to discover family and mission through our house churches. This year, we're gonna relaunch our men's ministry we just know it's time that what, what we've created space for women, I know it's in Pastor Emily's heart to even do more, but that we would begin to take intentional steps of gatherings, discipleships, and retreats for our men. We are intentionally creating and reinforcing pathways of belonging and discipleship. We're launching what we call foundations, which are classes meant to understand the nature of who God is and who we are as a church and how to flourish in the midst of it. Launching activation mini courses where the very invitations of the way of Jesus, how to love like Jesus, how to pray like Jesus, how to walk in the power of the spirit like Jesus become places where we can not only learn but grow into what God has for us. And of course, the continuation of where God has placed an authority on our world around the scriptures, our school of biblical studies, integrating that deeper into our church and where God is taking the school of the New Testament. You may not know this, but we've helped launch several schools of the New Testament in other churches. And I believe that there is actually a nature of this that is meant to be in thousands of churches that you and I are called to be a part of. We want to create a school of the Old Testament. And of course we want to, yeah. It's a, it's a weird church that I'm absolutely in love with that cheers for the school of the Old Testament. We want to launch our next school of spiritual formation and the rhythms of being a community of radical discipleship and formation. Friends, we need to grow as evangelists individually and corporately. Uh, I'm 
God wants to restore hearts that break for the lost. Gosh. We are going to relaunch Global Missions. As Pastor Sean has taken this and led this, creating a missions community, actually here in a matter of weeks, you're going to hear a vision and heart for the nations. Trips we've located Turkey and Cambodia and South Korea as core partners, though our heart is for the world, and trips that are gonna be begin to be taken and how we as a church not only go, but pray, stand in support and reclaim a heart for the nations and everything that we do. Dedicate to becoming a house of prayer, putting an emphasis and growing what's happening in our prayer house. I believe that God has asked us to not just be a place that opens its door for prayer twice a week, but to become a prayer house for our city morning, afternoon, and evening, the believers from our entire city would come to contend in prayer. We're growing a prayer community. We're launching nights of prayer and worship and healing. We feel that God has asked us to take a step of this learning how to live our liturgy. We recite almost every week. In fact, our next teaching series will be this. There are things that God is asking to bring our heart of generosity back into the forefront. We cannot be on our heels but it's time to step into the fullness of what God has. And it's time for us to mobilize the gospel, to partner with church planting, to send Mitch and Zoe here in this next month, to something that has been in my heart for a while, but I know that the time to really move towards it is now, which is to pursue the launch of a Spanish-speaking congregation of the square. And there's more but these are the things that are right in front of us, that it's time for us to move towards. And I just say, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? If not now, then when? It's just time for a church with its windows open to step into the promises of God. And it doesn't matter what lion's dens come when our eyes are fixed on our true home and our true king. It's not that we learn to escape. We learn how to live. I know I have to close a service. The next service literally starts in eight minutes. Will you stand with me? Prayer teams come forward. Let me, let me just close on this and then I will send you out. Over the last uh, year, I told you a handful of stories of a moment where I walked with a mentor in my life named Jerry Cook. Uh, he was a significant person and spiritual father in a season of great trial and distress for me, mostly around the uncertainty of my own life and calling and future, whether I was really called to pastor, whether I could really live this life and sustain it. I was, Processing with him challenges that it were really difficult for me. Challenges that provoked questions around identity and direction and purpose. And I remember there was a moment he just in the midst of it just looked at me and he said, Phil, the truth is you will never actually be a leader until you learn that when you take a punch, you have to stand up and keep leading. And he like leaned in and he goes, it's not that I don't have compassion for you. I think I'm just the one who needs to tell you, stand up, grab some ice and punch back. And I just, today I wanna tell you, no matter what has found its way into your life, no matter what punch to the mouth you've taken, what plan has been disrupted, what's gotten on its hills, what's responded and reacted. Let me be a father who looks at you and says, I think it's time to stand up. And I think it's time to take your place. And where you've been on the side, it's time to be in the center. Where you have been disconnected, it's time to be connected. Where you have taken yourself out, let me remind you, you didn't earn this. You're an object of grace and it's by Jesus' power. He loves to take broken things and broken people and do glorious works of wholeness through them. It's time for us to take the mission that God has asked us to have and to move it to the world.
Come on, Jesus, we love you. We honor you. And we just say, thank you. Would we be found like Daniel? That no matter what comes, we know who we are. We know why we're alive. And we know where we're going. Because we know where our true home is. We love you and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, God bless you. Having a great rest of your day.